In our solar system, most planets spin counterclockwise, but not Venus. This rebel planet decided to spin clockwise, and scientists are still trying to figure out why. By the way, why do planets rotate in general? What defines the speed of their rotation? Does the sun rotate? Buckle up and let's try to answer these questions. Venus is the second planet from the sun and the hottest planet in our solar system. Did you know that Venus is sometimes called Earth's twin? That's because it's similar in size and composition to our own planet. But that's where the similarities end because Venus is a pretty crazy place to say the least. For example, the weather. On Venus, it's always hot and cloudy. And when I say hot, I mean it like it's over 800 degrees Fahrenheit there. And those clouds, they're not made of water like the ones on Earth. Instead, they're made of sulfuric acid. So yeah, you wouldn't want to go outside without a really good sunscreen on Venus. If you look at the photos taken from its surface, you can see these toxic yellow clouds and cracked, desolate landscapes. And the spacecraft that captured this turned off almost immediately after sending these photos. Poor fella. But the surface of Venus isn't just some solid, dark, flat land. In fact, Venus has mountains that are taller than Mount Everest. These mountains aren't made of rock like the ones on Earth, though. Instead, they're made of a kind of volcanic material that's denser than... Venus is a pretty creepy place that holds many mysteries. One of them has been puzzling scientists for years, and this is the planet's rotation. Most planets in our solar system rotate counterclockwise, but Venus isn't like the other girls. It rotates clockwise, and that's not all. It also rotates around the sun faster than it rotates around itself. In other words, a year on this planet passes faster than a day. It's almost like Venus made being quirky its life mission. But why is that? Well, scientists have a few theories. The most popular theory says that Venus was actually spinning counterclockwise like the other planets, but then something happened to flip it around. And what could that something be, you ask? A planet-sized object. Yep, astronomers believe that something huge once collided with Venus, causing it to spin in the opposite direction. You can imagine this like a cosmic billiard shot, with this mysterious huge object being the cue ball and Venus being the target ball. But we can't actually say that Venus is spinning the wrong way. There's no such thing as a wrong direction of spin in the universe. This is actually called the retrograde rotation. This is when a planet rotates in the opposite direction to its orbit around the sun. Venus, for example, has a retrograde rotation, which means that the sun rises in the west and sets in the east on that planet. So now when the horoscope says something like Mercury in retrograde, you'll know what it means. Oh, but Venus isn't the only weird one in our solar system. There are definitely some wacky ways that planets can rotate. For example, most planets in our solar system spin around an imaginary line called an axis. This axis is usually straight up and down in relation to the planet's orbit around the sun. However, some planets like Uranus have a tilted axis which means it's almost on its side in relation to its orbit. This tilt causes the planet's poles to be nearly in the same place as its orbit. The result? As the planet orbits the sun, different parts of it receive different amounts of sunlight, causing extreme seasonal variations. For example, one pole might experience continuous sunlight, while the other is in complete darkness for a long time. Uranus is the only planet in our solar system that rotates on its side. Scientists think that it could repeat Venus's history. Once upon a time, a large impact knocked Uranus off its original axis of rotation, causing it to tilt at an angle of 98 degrees. We should be grateful for Jupiter. Its crazy gravity pulls all the asteroids and protects us from such collisions. All this is somewhat similar to tidally locked planets. Imagine going on a date with a planet, but instead of being charming and mysterious like you'd hoped, it's just staring at you with the same face all night long. That's basically what it's like to hang out with a tidally locked planet. 
tidally locked planets are planets that rotate around their axis at the same rate that they orbit their star. This means that the same side of the planet always faces the star, while the other side is in permanent darkness. Being tidally locked can have some weird effects on the planet's climate and weather. The side facing the star can become extremely hot, while the other side can be incredibly cold. The atmosphere on the planet can also get pretty wild, with strong winds blowing from the hot side to the cold side. And it doesn't have to be planets only. Our moon also works this way. Did you know that we always see only one side of the moon? That's because it's tidally locked to the Earth. We can also take the dwarf planet Pluto as an example. It has a strange rotational relationship with its largest moon, Charon. They're tidally locked, which means that they always face each other with the same side. As a result, Pluto and Charon appear to waltz around a common center of gravity, creating a unique dance in space. But the oddities of our solar system don't end there. There are also planets with super fast rotations. While most planets rotate at a fairly sedate pace, some of them are sonic levels fast. Jupiter, for example, rotates once every 9 hours and 56 minutes, which means that it has a day that's less than 10 hours long. That's fast enough to cause the planet to bulge out at its equator. And also, this rapid rotation creates strong bands of winds that can reach speeds of up to 400 miles per hour. And if all this still seems logical and kind of makes sense, then how about chaotic rotations? Yep, some planets have a rotation that's so irregular and unpredictable that it's known as chaotic rotation. This is often caused by the gravitational influence of nearby moons or other planets. And it's mostly the case with moons and small objects like that. In our solar system, some moons of Pluto, Saturn, and Neptune have chaotic rotation. By the way, the Sun rotates too, just like the planets. However, its rotation is not uniform. The equator rotates faster than the poles. Pretty weird, isn't it? This phenomenon creates a magnetic field that's responsible for phenomena like sunspots and solar flares. But all this raises an interesting topic. Why do planets rotate in the first place? This may sound like a silly question, but can you answer it? The answer might be trickier than you imagine. It all started around 4.5 billion years ago with the formation of our solar system. When it formed, it started as a large cloud of gas and dust. As the cloud began to contract due to its own gravity, it began to spin faster and faster like a spinning top. This spinning motion caused the cloud to flatten into a disk-like shape. As the cloud continued to contract, the center became denser and hotter, eventually forming the sun. Meanwhile, the material in the disk began to clump together and form planets. But because the disk was already spinning, this spinning motion was inherited by the planets as they formed. In other words, the planets rotate by inertia. They inherited the spinning motion of the cloud of gas and dust from which they formed. This is known as the conservation of angular momentum. This is the same principle that causes ice skaters to spin faster when they bring their arms in. And that's a wrap on the wacky world of planet rotations. From the lightning-fast spin of Jupiter to the bizarre backwards rotation of Venus, it's clear that our solar system is full of surprises. But thanks to the laws of physics and the gravitational pull of the Sun, these planets continue to spin on, keeping time with the steady beat of the cosmos. Stay tuned! You're on a spaceship flying through outer space at a speed of 180,000 miles per second. This is almost the speed of light. Make yourself comfortable, because the voyage is going to be long. It will last a little more than 90 years. It's better to use a cryo capsule to not get bored. In short, you need to fly for almost a century at the speed of light to get to a mysterious exoplanet that scientists have recently discovered. They have found many planets in the last few years, but this one can help in the search for extraterrestrial life. The planet looks like a dark blue ball and has a complex technical name consisting of letters and numbers. It's about the size of Neptune 
and orbiting around a little star of Class M, or in simple words, around a red dwarf. The planet is eight times closer to its star than Earth is to the Sun. But this doesn't mean that fiery layers of magma cover the surface of this world. The temperature on this exoplanet is pretty low, and similar to Earth's. That's because the red dwarf is not as hot as our Sun. But the most exciting thing is that the atmosphere of this space object consists of water vapor, or helium, or helium hydrogen. Scientists don't know for sure, so they actively observe it. But if there is water in its atmosphere, then life can exist. It's unlikely we will discover some big creatures, but even microscopic bacteria would be a big sensation. Another reason why scientists keep their eyes on this planet is its origin. If they find out what the planet's atmosphere is made of, they'll understand how such objects can form around red dwarfs. This will be another little brick of understanding of how the universe works. Even if they discover life on this strange planet, it will be impossible to transport it from there for us to study. Fortunately, there's another massive object near Earth where microbes can live, and it's located inside our solar system. In 2020, scientists detected a strange gaseous substance in Venus's atmosphere. These were chemical residues of phosphine. This is a significant finding because phosphine exists on Earth near some microbes. They've recently discovered phosphine in penguins' bodies. Many people started to put out theories that these animals came to us from Venus. But, of course, this is not true. You can also find this substance among swamps and mud. So it was a big surprise when they found residual phosphine parts on another planet. It's weird, since life on Venus's surface most likely cannot exist. The temperature and pressure on the planet are just too high. But high up in the sky of Venus, the conditions are not so terrible. Perhaps some microbes live there. But scientists also know that volcanoes often erupt there. A chemical trace of phosphine may appear as a result of these eruptions. If this is the real reason for the appearance of phosphine, they probably won't find any life. Now they're spending a lot of money on the study of this planet. But let's go back to deep space. Over the past 20 years, scientists have been finding exoplanets far and not too far from us. Some of them orbit around dwarfs and big stars, but some planets exist entirely alone. They don't belong to the orbit of any star. They are abandoned in cold outer space. Another exciting thing is that scientists haven't found a planetary system similar to our solar one. All distant exoplanets are located at different distances from their stars. Their sizes and masses are not like those that our planets have. We call them exoplanets since they're beyond our solar system. Some other fascinating space objects are super-Earths. If some planet weighs from 2 to 10 Earth masses, is 2 times bigger, and gets energy from a star, it's called a super-Earth. No more similarities with our home. Super-Earth can consist of gas, rocks, water, ice, fire, acid, glass, or diamonds. Scientists haven't yet found a super-Earth with ideal conditions for humans. Not because all planets are bad for life, but because our body has evolved and adapted to Earth only. We don't know much about super-Earths. They contain a massive amount of energy because of their enormous masses, and this energy is released. Therefore, frequent volcanic eruptions and earthquakes occur on many of these planets. Thunderstorms happen there almost every day. And by the way, one day there lasts several times longer than our 24-hour one. Let's imagine you're on the spaceship again, traveling to some super-Earth. So here it is, massive, orange, majestic. You put on a spacesuit, get into a space capsule, and you change your mind. The whole planet resembles a fiery boiling ball. If it has any life, it must be some invulnerable creatures. You're not like that, so you fly away to look for another super-Earth. A couple light years away, that giant ball seems to be a friendly place. Wait, this world is located far from its star. The temperature there is so low that even molecules freeze. Antarctica is like a hot desert compared with this super-Earth. You continue your voyage and finally find a perfect spot. It's three times heavier and twice bigger in size than Earth. It consists of rocks, gases, and possibly water. You descend to the planet on the transport capsule, open the door, and take one step. 
Your legs are too heavy. Your whole body has gained weight. You feel as if you were carrying a huge box of bricks on your back. You can't even walk a few feet. And the reason for this is gravity. The greater the weight the Super Earth is, the greater its gravitational force becomes. You are pressed to the ground, and your muscles are too weak for this. Also, increased gravity provokes active fluctuations of tectonic plates. Earthquakes and landslides happen on this planet pretty often. The rocky surface here is constantly changing. To live on such a planet, you would need to develop new technology to build houses. You get back into the capsule and fly away, but not too far. The planet's gravity doesn't allow your ship to rise high into the sky. It's like ropes pulling you down. You use all the remaining fuel to overcome the gravity and go beyond the atmosphere. Another problem with such worlds is meteorites. Gravity attracts not only your ship, but also colossal space objects flying by. A giant asteroid can get off its route because of the attraction of the super Earth. It can hit the planet in the form of a meteor shower, but the falling speed is also faster, so the destruction will be more massive. But the worst thing that can happen to the super Earth is the stoppage of the planet's core caused by high pressure. Hundreds of billions of tons of solid rock can squeeze the heart of this world, and the core should always be in motion to perform its primary function, keeping the magnetic field working. Solar storms and cosmic radiation can create severe problems for all life on the surface. On Earth, these storms disrupt the operation of electronics and affect human health. This happens even if small holes appear in the magnetic field. And what would happen if all the protection disappears? The energy of the closer star and the radiation from distant space would quickly destroy the super Earth and make it impossible for life to develop. All these events can happen to a super Earth with ideal conditions for living. And such a planet is a rarity. Most super Earths have terrible surfaces and atmospheres. There's a planet where the air is so hot that it can evaporate metals. The fiery wind simply splits any solid substance into molecules. Such a super Earth is more like a star, not an ordinary planet. Also, there's another super Earth, wholly covered with water. You won't find a single piece of land there. The ocean floods any island in a second. And underwater, there are volcanoes. They erupt almost every hour, releasing billions of tons of magma. Because of the heavy weight, the planet is slightly tilted. When it rotates around its axis, the water flows from one side to another. This creates huge destructive tsunamis bigger than the size of Everest. And how about a super Earth where it's raining diamonds or sulfuric acid? The surface of another distant world is blown by winds consisting of glass. There's a lot of fire and sand. When the hot air burns the sand particles, they turn into glass. Among all such planets, Ours seems to be a paradise, but perhaps for some strange organisms living at the distant end of the galaxy, Earth may seem to be a terrible world. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, 
they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 60-40 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging considering the many external factors and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. 
The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains, but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated. Any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they?